Hello and welcome to this session on business research methodology. I am Rajesh Durbala, your instructor. I am an assistant professor in business analytics and research methodology. Today we will be dealing with measurement and scaling. That is going to be quite a very important topic and the learning outcomes from this session would be you will be able to understand the scale of measurement and four levels of data measurement. Number two, understand the criteria for good measurement. Number three, learn about the various established measurement scales used in business research. And number four, understand the factors to be considered in selecting the appropriate measurement scales. So in brief, if I have to tell you what you would learn by the end of this session is, you will be able to understand what scales are, how do scales perform, when to select which scale and how would you validate whether your scale is a good scale or not. So moving ahead. First and foremost, it's very, very important to know what has to be measured. So the measurement of physical properties obviously is not a complex deal, whereas measurement of psychological properties or abstract phenomenon requires a careful attention of a researcher. Now, if I need to know the consumer behavior, the consumer perception, what is the attitude of a consumer towards your product or what is the attitude of a consumer towards a brand? These are very abstract terms which are very difficult to mm, maybe quantify. Okay, So I would say these are very esoteric terms and quantifying them and putting them into a very numeric data becomes quite a difficult task. So what we are going to do is we have to understand how these things could be measured. Okay. And number two, the quality of the research always depends on the fact that what measurement techniques are adopted by the researcher. So the crux of the entire research depends on what kind of a techniques the researcher has adopted and how these fit in the prevailing research circumstances. So their uh, aptness, how appropriate they are for the circumstances or for the condition or for the context in which the research is being performed, that is the entire cornerstone for the research. If they are good, the research is going to be awesome. And if it's not that good, the research is badly screwed up. So move ahead. Scales of measurement. These are the four scales, nominal, ordinal, interval and ratio. In the forthcoming slides, I'll elaborate on what each kind of a scale is. The first two nominal and ordinal scales. Now let us say if I ask you, what is the significance of the number on the jersey of a footballer? You must have seen many of the sportsmen, they wear some shirts with some numbers on them. What is the significance of those numbers? Is it the ranking of that player? Or is it the order in which the batsman or the player comes to bat if it's cricket? What is the significance? If I wonder, I believe there's no other sequence other than recognition. If they are playing in the field, the commentator, maybe, you know, they may not recognize them by their faces because it's quite far. So rather what they would do is they would like to recognize the number on their t-shirts. So. The numbers on their t-shirts or the jerseys or the shirts or jackets, whatever you say, it's just for recognizing those players. So any number, any uh, name that is given just to label for identification, that's nothing but a nominal scale. The roll numbers of students, the pan card, the phone numbers, all these are just for recognition. They do not have any quantitative significance or statistical importance. So that becomes your nominal scale. Now, ordinal scale, it talks about just, it talks about your ranking. Okay. For example, let us say, if I say India is at the top of world test rankings in the cricket. So what does that mean? 
it simply means that it that it's at the top it's the order it's the rank so whenever a customer ranks the preferences of his or her products that again has no uh, it doesn't hold much statistical importance or significance what it tells you is just ranking so you have to be careful about what it is so in ordinal scale ordinal scale just used to rank or ob uh, rank or order the objects okay you have to remember it's just to rank or order the objects then we have interval scales in interval level measurement the difference between two consecutive numbers is meaningful okay whatever the two numbers whatever the difference is that's quite important so such kind of a things are interval scales okay and uh, let us say if i order three things a b and c the gap between a and b would be equal to the gap between b and c so that becomes interval scale fourth one ratio scale ratio scale it tries to figure out the ratio between two values the ratio level measurements possess they obviously have all the qualities of interval scale but also they talk about the ratio of two values okay mm what i can say is let us say if i'm talking about the salary of a person or the height or the distance all these things can be put into ratio scales so it's very very difficult to use ratio scale in many of the circumstances but i'll discuss or elaborate it in further slides let's move now if you see if i talk about the spectra the breadth of applications then you can see the least the lowest usage potential is for nominal data okay it's because just for recognition it's just for labeling and the second level is ordinal data ordinal data is nothing but ranking interval data it has it talks about the gap between two values and the ratio data it talks about the ratio between two okay and one more very interesting thing that you can remember is ratio scale in ratio data it talks about measuring okay it is not counting it is measuring so you have to remember this information now let us see what is the criteria for good measurement the criteria anything if it has to be called as a good scale for measurement it needs to have these validity reliability and sensitivity okay and how valid it is it can again be classified as content validity criterion validity and contrast validity and sorry it's not contrast it's construct validity and construct validity can further be classified as convergent validity and discriminant validity similarly reliability can be classified into test retest reliability equivalent form reliability and internal consistency reliability okay we'll discuss and elaborate them in the forthcoming slides now let's talk about validity validity is put it briefly if an instrument measures what it has been designed to measure we can say that the instrument is valid now if i say the instrument has to measure the satisfaction levels of the customers and if it is able to measure the satisfaction levels of the customers i would say the instrument is valid so in simple terms it should measure or the measure should measure what it is supposed to measure but you know it has a great deal of difficulty in real life let us see how it's number 1 if i talk about the content validity okay now content validity includes but it is not limited to careful specification of constructs review of scaling procedures by content validity 
and consultation with experts and the members of the population. This is defined by VOG in 2004. Now this content validity is many a times referred to as face validity also. <coughs> but uh, the problem is it's a very subjective evaluation of the scale for its ability to measure what it is supposed to measure. So many of the quantitative researchers, they do not support this. They may not consider this to be a valid scale, but anyway, many of the quantitative researcher, qualitative researchers, in fact, they definitely go ahead with this content validity. Okay. So what is more important you have to remember is it's also called face validity. Second is criterion validity. Now criterion validity is the ability of the variable to predict the key variables or criteria. Now if the if it is if the criterion is valid, so it should be able to predict the variables or the key variables or the criteria. So it involves the determination of whether the scale is able to perform up to the expectations with respect to the other variables or criteria. Okay. So what we are trying to tell is I may have n number of different variables or criteria, and if this scale is able to perform up to the expectations and if it is able to match up with the other variables, I can say this is the criterion validity holds. Criterion variables may include demographic and psychographic characteristics, attitudinal and behavioral measures or scales obtained from other scales. So we could also say these are derived, these are derived variables. Now construct validity, the construct validity is, um, I can say the initial concept or the notion or the question or the hypothesis that determines which data are to be generated and how they are to be gathered. Okay, so all these things are very important. This is the initial initial concept, notion, question, hypothesis that determines which data are to be generated and how they are to be gathered. Clear? And this was defined by Golaf Shani in 2003. To achieve the construct validity, the researcher must focus on convergent validity and discriminant validity. We would discuss both the things convergent validity and discriminant validity in the forthcoming slides. The convergent validity is established when the new measure correlates or converges with other similar measures. Okay, so it's more of a drawing of consensus, more of meeting of minds. Okay, so two or more measures when they converge, when they talk about the similar measures, okay, then it is convergent. And the literal meaning of correlation or convergence specifically indicates the degree to which the score on one measuring instrument or the scale is correlated with the measuring instrument or scale developed to measure the same constructs. That is to say, if two or more constructs are measuring the same thing and they conclude or they come up with the same result, there is convergent validity. Now, discriminant validity is established when a new measuring instrument has low correlation or non-convergence with the measures of dissimilar concept. Okay. So if there are dissimilar constructs or concepts and there is low correlation or no convergence at all. Okay. So obviously two unrelated things should definitely have low correlation. They should not be converging. Okay. And if you, you know, when you come up with regression, you will see that we also discuss something called multicollinearity. In multicollinearity, we would check whether two different variables have high degree of correlation or not. If there is high degree of correlation between two independent variables, then it is very difficult to say which variable is resulting in the change or alteration in the dependent variable. So 
we try to reduce the multicollinearity. So, if the variables have discriminant validity, then the problems of multicollinearity would not occur. Okay. So, this is what the significance of discriminant validity is. Moving ahead, the second point is reliability. So, first thing, first criteria for a good scale was validity. Second one is reliability. Reliability is the tendency of a respondent to respond in the same or in a similar manner to an identical or near identical question. That is to say, if I ask a respondent about a question or similar questions time and again, and you will see that the respondent is answering in the same or similar pattern, there is reliability, high degree of reliability. But if the answers keep varying, the reliability is questionable. Okay, That is what is reliability. You can pause the screen or you can pause the video and take notes if required, but it's quite simple. I suppose you can understand what is reliability. Now, first thing, how to, you know, how you can understand or test the uh, reliability. First is test retest reliability. To execute the test retest reliability, the same questionnaire is administered to the same respondent to elicit responses in two different time slots. So it's quite simple. I have a same questionnaire. I have the same respondent, but I make the respondent answer the same questionnaire in different uh, time spans. So let us say if I give uh, administer the questionnaire today, and I administer the same questionnaire after some time. And if the there is a high degree of similarity between the two responses, then we could say there is high degree of reliability. Okay. So higher correlation coefficient indicates a higher reliable measuring instrument and lower correlation coefficient indicates an unreliable measuring instrument. So quite simple. Now equivalent forms reliability. In equivalent, equivalent forms reliability, Mm, what we do is uh, usually what we uh, how to put it this way uh, we execute two equivalent forms which are constructed with different sample of items uh, that is to say the forms contain two types of questions but the structure is quite similar but there is some little bit of difference. So, if I am asking, let us say, I uh, administer a survey and I give a questionnaire to the uh, to the respondents, and I ask the respondents to answer the questions. So, after the respondent answers, I give them another sample questions, and the questions this time are quite similar. The structure of the questions is quite similar but with a slight bit of difference, then it could be, uh, if I match the correlation of the answering pattern, and if I see the respondents ha responses have high degree of correlation, then I could say there is high degree of reliability. If there is very low degree of correlation, then the reliability is questionable. Then internal consistency reliability. The internal consistency reliability is used to assess the reliability of a summated scale by which several items are summed to form a total score. Okay, That is simply what we are trying to do is, we are trying to create sums of various scales Okay, and uh, by which several items are summed to form a total score. So the final scale is the sum total of various small different scales. Okay, What we try to do is simply one of them is a split half technique. Okay, We split the entire data into two parts and once the two parts are split and we try to conduct a test and if both the sums uh, in this technique the items are divided into equivalent groups this division is done on the basis of some predefined aspects as odd versus even numbers questions okay or uh, after division responses on items are correlated and high correlation coefficient in indicates high internal consistency and low correlation coefficient indicates low internal consistency simple 
Now, subjectivity in the process of splitting the items into two parts poses some common problems for the researchers. And a very important or common approach is to deal with the problem is coefficient alpha or Cronbach alpha. This is quite important and uh, you can do this very easily on SPSS. Uh, and now what is Cronbach alpha? The coefficient alpha or Cronbach alpha is actually a mean reliability coefficient for all the different ways of splitting the items included in the measuring instrument. Okay, so it is just it is a measure it is a mean reliability coefficient okay for uh, all the different ways of splitting the items included in the measuring instrument as different from correlation coefficient coefficient alpha varies from 0 to 1 and a coefficient value of 0 0.6 or less is considered to be unsatisfactory so it's so simple Cronbach Kron alpha has to be anything more than 0 0.6 to 1 sensitivity sensitivity is the ability of the measuring instrument to measure the meaningful differences in the response obtained from the subjects included in the study i could say very simply one word that is responsiveness okay so whatever you are trying to measure your scale has to be responsive so sensitivity is not that quite important but if you are interested you can pause the video and you can give it a reading now measurement scales okay now there are majorly I can classify some scales to be comparative scales or non comparative scales okay I will just go ahead and uh, we can just see let me see if I have a diagram yes okay now I have see the classifications of measurement scales could be single item scales multiple item scales and continuous rating scales in single item scales you can see you have multiple choice scales force choice ranking scales paired comparison scales constant sum scales direct quantification scales and q sort scales similarly multiple item scales you have likert scales semantic differential scales staple scales and numerical scales okay and the final one is continuous rating scales we'll discuss all of them in detail with examples number one single item scales okay so as the name suggests single item scales measures only one item as a construct some of the commonly used single item scales in the field of business research are multiple choice scales force ranking scales paired comparison scales constant sum scales direct quantification scales and q sort scales okay multiple choice you know how multiple choices are researcher tries to generate some basic information to conduct his or her research work and for the sake of convenience or for the further analysis he or she codes it by assigning different numbers of different characteristics of interest okay now this type of measurement is commonly referred to as multiple choice scales and the result is generating the nominal data from multiple choice scales you hardly get any kind of a quantifiable data it's mostly nominal data okay for example which of the following cities do you live in okay if you are listing four to five cities if you tick on a particular city let us say mumbai mumbai doesn't form any other it doesn't form a ratio or an interval scale it definitely forms only a nominal data okay then for example the multiple choice scales do you own a car yes or no okay do you belong to which region andhra pradesh chhattisgarh madhya pradesh gujarat bihar B B uh, punjab now you can see all these are nominal data okay when you have questions like do you own a car the answer is yes or no these kind of questions also are known as dichotomous questions okay then forced choice ranking in the forced choice ranking scaling technique the respondent rank different objects 
simultaneously from a list of objects presented to him okay so n number of objects are given to him and the respondent ranks them for example let us say following is the list of some color television brands available in an indian market please rank the brands in order of your preference by assigning one to the most preferred brand two to the next preferred brand and so forth keeping please keep in mind that no two brands should receive the same equal rank order okay so i have given you six brands and i have to rank them on 1 to 6 okay one being the best six being the lowest and no two brands should get the same ranking so this is forced choice scale now paired comparison technique now as the name indicates you have to make comparisons between a pair okay now a respondent is presented a pair of objects or stimulus or brands and the respondent is supposed to provide his or her presence preference of the object from a pair now see how it is done when n items objects or brands are included in the study a respondent has to make n into n minus 1 by two paired comparisons okay that is to say if i have 10 objects or brands then how many paired comparisons i need to make is 10 into 9 by 2 that is almost 45 paired comparisons so let us see how that works you can see the customer is like uh, asked to compare between different pairs or brands of ceiling fans okay now let us see i have polar usha bajaj khetan okay now plus indicates that the column brand is preferred over the row brand and minus indicates that the row brand is preferred over the column brand clear now let's see so plus indicates column brand is preferred over the row brand so if i see come here this minus brand minus means the row brand is preferred over the column brand so in this usha is preferred over polar okay in this bajaj is preferred over polar khetan is preferred over polar okay similarly if i see plus indicates that column brand is preferred over row so usha is preferred over polar usha is preferred over bajaj usha is preferred over khetan okay similarly bajaj is preferred over polar but uh, usha is preferred over bajaj okay and khetan is preferred over bajaj so you can understand how paired comparison works then constant sum scale in the constant sum scaling technique the respondents allocate points to more than one stimulus object or objects attributes or object properties such that total remains a constant sum you know i have a beautiful example which will help you understand this much better and in a simple way now you can see i have following section present six attributes about a car please indicate your points from uh, 100 more points you will assign will indicate your relative preference for that attribute the total of all the points should be equal to 100 if you feel that an attribute is not at all important then please assign zero for that attribute okay now let's see if i am buying a car what is the top most preference for me is price okay so most important attribute for me is price so 37 okay the second most is mileage so i give 33 okay and then rest i have space that is 10 color range that is 10 then i have interior decoration 5 power steering 5 put together it's 100 so it's very easy for me that for me price and mileage are the most important attributes so this is what is constant sum scale now direct quantification scale the simplest form of obtaining information is to directly ask a question related to some characteristics of interest resulting in ratio scaled data okay i'm asking the customer directly like if i ask him how much are you willing to pay for this product and the customer tells me that i am willing to pay 10000 dollars for this what am i asking is 
I am asking for a very very direct quantification and the output or the result or the response that I get is always a ratio data. For example, let's see how much is your income from sources other than salary. The answer that the respondent gives me it's going to be a quantifiable data. Then how many liters of petrol is monthly consumed using a personal car? Uh, the output or the response that the respondent provides me, it's going to be a hardcore number and that number becomes a ratio data. Similarly, how many, how much of sugar your family consumes in a month? So again, it could be one pound, two pounds, okay? So, or maybe how, uh, 10 kgs, okay? So all these information that I'm getting, it's going to be a direct quantification. So they all form ratio data, okay? So this is, next is QSART scales. In QSART scaling technique is to quickly classify a large number of objects, okay? So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to sort them. I want to put them into various bins, okay? Now let's see how. Next is multi-item scale. In multi-item scaling technique generally generates some interval type of information okay so very important multi item scales they generate some interval type of information in interval scaling technique a scale is constructed with the number of descriptions associated with each scale position therefore the respondents range on respondents rating on certain characteristics of interest is obtained for the majority of researchers the rating scales are the preferred measuring devices to obtain interval or quasi interval data on the personal characteristics that is attitude preference and opinions of the individual of all kinds this is the definition given by peterson so not, not much important what is more important is what are the types or what are the various uh, uh, various formations of multi item scales let's see <coughs> First one is the summated scaling techniques, that's Likert scale. Likert scale is one of the most popular, most popular of all the scales. You can have a Likert scale of five point scale, seven point scale, even 10 points. Uh, usually we use some odd numbers, five, seven, nine, 11, okay? So in a Likert scale, each item response has five rating categories, strongly agree to strongly disagree as two extremes with disagree, neither agree, nor disagree or agree in the middle of the scale. Okay. The analysis can be done by using either profile analysis or summated analysis. And uh, what is profile analysis is item by item analysis where the respondent scores are obtained for each item of the scale. And the analysis is also done on the basis of individual item scores. Okay. So, as another approach, scores are obtained from the respondents and the sum is obtained across the scale items. After summing, an average is obtained for all the respondents. The summated approach is widely used, which is why the Likert scale is also referred to the summated scale. So this is another very important aspect. You have to understand Likert scale is also called a summated scale. Now, this is a typical example. Now, I have following are the statements related to washing machines produced by multinational company indicate your answer in terms of your agreement or disagreement on the statement by circling the concern number as described below so you can see one strongly disagree and five strongly agree which is uh, and uh, i have disagree and agree and neither agree or disagree in the middle so for example price range for washing machine is appropriate so I would say strongly agree or strongly disagree one or five I'll circle whatever I feel like so this is the Likert scale now semantic differential scale the semantic differential scale consists of a series of bipolar adjectives whose words or phrases placed on the extreme points of the scale now good semantic differential scales keep some negative adjectives and some positive adjectives on the left side of the scale to tackle the problem of the halo effect. So these, this is just vocabulary. Two extreme words are used for... 
many a times just we are trying to balance the scale with some negative adjectives and some positive adjectives on the left side or else what happens is if i always keep positive on one side it creates something called a halo effect that is we get more fascinated with the positive attributes so these are some uh, examples of semantic differential you can see favorable unfavorable strong weak sweet bitter <coughs> aggressive see you can see negative words coming not intelligent iniquity moral okay so this is what is reducing the halo effects then i have the staple scale staple scale is also a kind of likert scale only okay this is the example of uh staple case now you can see satisfied how satisfied if i am positively satisfied i go towards the positive plus 5 if i am uh, not very satisfied i can go up till the negative minus 5 okay that is to say the customer never has or the respondent never has to give you a middle level answer then i have numerical scales in numerical scales provide equal intervals separated by numbers as scale points to the respondents the scales are generally 5 or 7 point rating scales okay this also looks something like this would you be buying the new product with a new features and high price definitely buy and definitely not buy so if it is towards the 7 means i'm close to definitely buying if i'm close to 1 the chances of not buying are high continuous rating scale here the respondent is offered a continuum and the respondent can put his preference or choice anywhere on the continuum without any rigid scaling it looks something like this very important and not important so very happy or not very uh, very happy and very unhappy so wherever the cu customer wants can put an x mark and that becomes a continuous rating scale okay so it doesn't put the customer into any kind of binding the customer is flexible to put his preference anywhere he wishes and uh, what are the various factors that are required in selecting an appropriate measurement scale that is first one it has to be very very objective in conducting the research okay there shouldn't be any degree of subjectivity number 2 that is decision based on the response data type generated by using a scale now if i want to generate ratio scale or interval scale what is the kind of scale that has to be a uh, if i have to generate ratio data or interval data what is the kind of scale that i need to use okay decision based on using single or multiple item scales so what kind of a scale i have to use single or multiple item scale that's again a very important decision and then decision based on forced or non forced choices do you want your respondent to be forced to make a choice or you want to leave the respondent at his own will decision based on using balanced or unbalanced scales so how balanced or skewed your scales are going to be that's again a very very important choice and decision based on the number of scale points whether it's going to be a 5 point scale 7 point scale 9 point scale so all these factors are quite important while selecting your scale okay so that was great interacting with you guys get in touch with me on linkedin facebook twitter you can write to me directly at rajeshdorbala@gmail.com thank you for your patience it was awesome listening to you and talking to you thank you see you soon